country. In my last video, I talked about the cosmic dawn, the end of the dark ages, after the universe had been evolving for a few hundred million years and came out of this when the first stars came online and nuclear fusion ignited for the first time and, and light flooded, new light flooded the universe for the first time in a very long time. It was a very dramatic, very cool event. And it's a, it's a hypothetical event. Well, I don't want to say hypothetical. Like, we know it happened because we have a picture of the universe from before there were stars, the cosmic microwave background, and we look around today, 13.8 billion years later, and there's like stars all over the place. So we know there had to be a time when the first stars came online. But we haven't observationally pinned it down. But we do know, we do have some rough estimates of when it occurred, when this process occurred. And these rough estimates come from a few different lines of evidence. One is something called optical depth. So optical depth is just how far light can penetrate something, right? Light can go really, really far through clear atmosphere, but if it's cloudy, light can't go very far. Its optical depth in a cloudy day is much, much lower than the optical depth of a clear day. We can apply this to the whole entire universe because we have a background light, the cosmic microwave background, surrounds our observable universe. That light has filtered through the entire universe, our observable universe, to get to our telescopes. And when the... And we can use this, sorry, we can use this to measure the total optical depth of the universe. And this is pretty handy. It's pretty cool. And something that the first stars did. So there was a, a phase transition when the cosmic microwave background was released, when the universe was only 280,000 years old. The universe became neutral. Then when the first stars came online and we started having things like supernova and quasars and all sorts of exciting energetic events, that released a tremendous amount of radiation that re-ionized the cosmos, that ripped apart all the pockets or most of the pockets of neutral hydrogen, neutral helium, turned them back into a plasma so that our present day universe is ionized once again, even though back in the distant past, for a while, it was neutral. And when this occurred, of, of, of how long you get to have a neutral universe before it becomes reionized, that changes the optical depth between us and the cosmic microwave background. So we can use that to place some limits on when the first stars had to come online because they are the ones that are ultimately going to be responsible for reionizing the universe. So we have our optical depth. We have our fancy computer simulations, which allow us to track the growth of structures in the very early universe, starting from something that looks like the cosmic microwave background, evolving to something that looks like our present day arrangement of galaxies. See how these density changes amplify and reinforce and eventually collect together to become stars. That gives us some handle on when the first stars would have appeared. But we're trying, but but even though, even though these are all indirect lines of evidence, we don't have like a picture of this epoch because it's kind of hard to take a picture of neutral gas because neutral gas doesn't emit a lot of radiation. But there is an out here. There is something that allows us to take a picture of neutral hydrogen. It's the craziest thing in the world. And, and this is this has to do with the space spin state of hydrogen atoms itself. You know, spin, quantum mechanical spin, so, so each and every individual subatomic particle carries a spin. Uh, you can kind of sort of imagine it as like little tiny spinning tops, but, but don't take that analogy too far because, uh, well, you should just watch the episodes I did on quantum spin. And in a normal hydrogen atom, you have one proton and one electron. Usually, their spins are anti-aligned like this. Like the proton is pointing up, say, and the electron is pointing down. They're totally happy doing this. Every, every, every once in a while, just randomly, because of quantum mechanics, the electron will flip and now they'll be parallel. But this is an unstable state. They don't like this at all. Very, very quickly, they will decay back into the lower energy state that they prefer. They're like, no, never mind. This, this is not what I had in mind. It's not as fun as I thought it was going to be. I much prefer doing this. 
that transition releases a little bit of energy, a little bit of light in light of a very specific wavelength, 21 centimeters, 21 centimeters, about yay big or so, 21 centimeter radiation. This is the radiation emitted by neutral hydrogen. So you can build a detector at 21 centimeters and you can go looking for this radiation when you know it. There are pockets of neutral hydrogen all throughout our galaxy. We can map these out in our galaxy. At one time, 13.5 billion years ago, our universe was almost entirely neutral hydrogen. It was emitting this kind of radiation. But 13.8 billion or 13.5 billion years ago was very far in the past when our universe was smaller, right? And since the universe has expanded, that 21 centimeter radiation has been stretched out. It's been stretched out and it's no longer 21 centimeters. It's more like two meters. Two meters is radio. It's a radio frequency now. It's not, now, not, not like this. It's now like this. So you need to build a big radio array or antenna or dish to capture that radiation, that signal from the dark ages, from the cosmic dawn, from this era when the universe was neutral. And it's really hard. It's like so unbelievably hard. The challenge here, the challenge here is that it's neutral hydrogen. It's very far away. It's incredibly tiny weak signal. It's like this, this bare whisper in the radio. And if you haven't noticed, there's a lot of stuff in the present day modern universe that emits radio waves. Like, I don't know, people, satellites, Jupiter, our galaxy's own magnetic field, supernova, Seifert galaxies, like, like, the radio frequencies in our universe are totally swamped with all sorts of loud signals. And they are very loud. They're like 10,000 times louder than this background signal from the dark ages itself. So the challenge here is being able to collect the data, filter out all the present day universe stuff and get to that very, very faint whisper. That is an incredibly challenging problem. Very difficult analysis. There are multiple teams around the world with multiple instruments that are trying to get at this cosmic dawn, at the, at the uh, epoch of reionization, at the dark ages, this whole era in our universe. Hopefully in the next few years, we'll actually have a confirmed detection of a signal. And, and then we'll, then it's game on. Then we have actual data from this epoch. We're not just bookending it with a cosmic microwave background and modern galaxy surveys. We're actually doing direct imaging, direct signal analysis, direct mapping of these dark ages to figure out how structures are forming, when the first stars are igniting. It's going to be a big deal. It's, this is a major frontier in modern cosmology, major, major frontier. And there's a lot of juicy information there that's just waiting for us to be, for it to be discovered. It's not the only track to get at the epoch of the first stars. We also have more traditional telescopes like the upcoming James Webb Space Telescope. The James Webb Space Telescope isn't powerful enough to see individual stars at that distance, and is probably not powerful enough to see the very first generation of stars to come online in the universe, but it will probably be able to see the first galaxies that come online. So it's just after this epoch, just after the cosmic dawn, just as the first stars pop, they start agglomerating to form galaxies. That's when James Webb is going to capture them. Again, that light, these galaxies are very bright in the visible at their epoch, but that was a long time ago, and that light has been redshifted down into the infrared. And that's why James Webb is going to be primarily an infrared telescope, because it's, it's doing galaxy surveys that we know all and love, but at extreme distances in the younger universe. And that light has been redshifted. So it's going to be very pinpointed, very targeted. It will get detailed information on galaxy, 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 galaxy in the very early universe. If we take that very detailed imaging 
in analysis of individual galaxies with more broader, but say lower resolution, but more global images from the radio arrays designed to go after the dark ages will be able to put together that picture of what the universe was up to in its first few hundred million years, which will be absolutely fascinating. And I just can't wait to see what comes out. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Please consider contributing to patreon.com slash PM Sutter. It's how all of my education and outreach initiatives keep going. It is 100% fan supported. How about that? Isn't that great? Yes, I agree. <laughs> and also, please, if you have a moment, please don't forget to subscribe, like the video, make sure notifications are turned on uh, so you can keep up to date with all of my videos. They're all lots of fun to do. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.